it's good to be able to bring God's word to you. I'm sorry that we can't be together in person, but it's good to be able to open God's word and to hear his word today. I want to read to you from um, the prophecy of Isaiah and chapter 42, and I'm going to read verses 1 to 9. And in the NIV that I'm reading from, it's headed, The Servant of the Lord. Isaiah 42. Here is my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him and he will bring justice to the nations. He will not shout or cry out or raise his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break and a smouldering wick he will not snuff out. In faithfulness he will bring forth justice. He will not falter or be discouraged till he establishes justice on earth. In his teaching the islands will put their hope. This is what God the Lord says, the creator of the heavens who stretches them out, who spreads out the earth with all that springs from it, who gives breath to its people and life to those who walk in it. I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness. I will take hold of your hand. I will keep you and make you to be a covenant for the people and a light for the Gentiles, to open eyes that are blind, to free captives from prison and to release from the dungeons those who sit in darkness. I am the Lord, that is my name. I will not yield my glory to another or my praise to idols. See, the former things have taken place and new things I declare. Before they spring into being, I announce them to you. Well, this uh, passage that I've just read to you in Isaiah 42 is the first of four servant songs that are identified in the prophecy of Isaiah. We won't look at the others today, but if you want to read them another time they're in chapter 49 verses 1 to 7 then in chapter 50 verses 4 to 11 and then in chapter 52 verse 13 through to chapter 53 and verse 12 that's the best known one the one that speaks about uh, the, the one who was pierced for our transgressions in Isaiah 53. Now each of these four servant songs describes naturally a character a figure who's called the servant of the Lord. And there are some similarities between them which are worth us realising, even with this one that we're looking at today. The servant of the Lord is one in whom he delights, a chosen one. He's one who's on a mission for God, a mission to the nations. He's one who may well suffer at the hands of those he goes to, but one who will be vindicated in the end. And those themes run through all of those four servant songs. And they're written in the uh, typical poetic style that was uh, familiar to to Hebrew writers and readers. Uh, One of the key characteristics is its parallel images. And you see that here uh, in the the verses that we've read in uh, verse 2, for example. He will not shout or cry out or raise his voice in the streets. The first line would be sufficient to give us the information. He will not shout or cry out. He won't make a public attention, draw public attention to himself. But we're told then also um, he will not raise his voice in the streets. It gives depth and colour and richness to the description. But it's not not meant to be some difference that we're meant to spot. It's a a parallel image. And the same very much so, for example, in verse 3. A bruised reed he will not break, a smouldering wick he will not snuff out. Different images, but saying very much the same thing, that he is gentle in the way that he deals with people. So these are the servant songs. This is the first of four of them in the prophecy of Isaiah. I want to think for a few minutes about the servant, about about his character, about his mission, and then about his God, the one who sends him. So first of all, in verses one to four, particularly the servant's character. Well, he's God's chosen representative, and therefore he's favoured by God. Here is my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom I delight. He's not uh, distant from the one who sends him. Uh, in many ways uh, he's, he's a special one, he's chosen, he's favoured, he's kept close as it were to the Lord who sends him. And one of the key truths here which we need to understand when we think about the character and and who this servant is, is that in verse 1 we're told, I will put my spirit on him. And rightly that's translated in most English versions with a capital S. This is not some impersonal force. 
Here is the personal Spirit of God himself indwelling the servant of the Lord. And the servant will bring justice. In other words, he'll, he'll be a person of righteousness. He'll be faithful. He will fulfil his mission. And do please note verse 3, because sometimes we think, well, righteousness and justice and fulfilling the mission, completing the task will be done just as long as it gets done. No, there's a way that he's going to operate. And verse 3 tells us he will be gentle in the way that he deals with people. He will be a bringer of justice, but also a bringer of peace and calm and tranquility. In the end, that's his aim, to be a peacemaker. He will not shout or cry out. He's not going to be somebody who's just making a scene, just drawing attention to himself. No, he has a task to fulfil, but he'll do it with gentleness. And he perseveres. He will keep going, verse 4. He will not falter or be discouraged until he establishes justice on earth. So that's his uh, character. But we've already touched on something of his mission. What will he do? Well, he will teach the nations. That's important, isn't it? You see that he's not simply uh, an action man, as it were, he's not just getting things done. He's also a teacher. Verse 4, in his teaching, the islands will put their hope. He will be listened to and he will bring a message of hope, a message of future plan and purpose, which will bring people up out of despair and give them hope for the future. And his mission will be um, worldwide. That comes out very clearly, not just here in the other servant songs as well. Uh, he will bring justice, verse 1, to the nations. And verse uh, 4, uh, he, will, uh, he will establish justice on earth. In his teaching, the islands will put their hope, the idea, if you like, of the, the furthest parts of the earth. Um, everything is included. Indeed, the one who uh, is sending him, verse 5, is the, is the Lord, who's the creator of the heavens, who spreads out the earth. So there's not a kind of small, local, parochial mission. This is a mission which is throughout the world. And what will he do? Well, look at who he is coming to. If you look on uh, in verse um, uh, 5 to 7, you see that the, the picture expands and enlarges there. And in verse 7 particularly, you see his mission, his purpose, to open eyes that are blind, to free captives from prison, to release from the dungeon those who sit in darkness. Now, these are physical outward uh, descriptions, people with blind eyes and people in prison. But we understand, don't we, in the, in the Old Testament, uh, never mind uh, in the New, where it's explicitly so, that, that God was not only concerned with the outward. He brought the people into a land. But he wanted to bless them. He wanted them to know him. That he, he is their covenant God. He is the God who has a relationship with them. So here is somebody who's going to, to come not just to improve people's standard of living, but to rescue them from a desperate need that they have. These are people who can't see and they need their eyes opened. These are people who are, are in captive captivity and they need to be released. And they can't do it themselves. The servant here has to be strong uh, in fulfilling his mission. So we've seen something of his character. He's, he's, he's spirit-filled, righteous, uh, but gentle. And his mission to, to teach the nations and to bring uh, spiritual release and, and uh, sight to those who are in darkness. But then we learn thirdly about the servant's God, about the Lord who sent him. And this is what is so uh, wonderful and so rich about this passage, because... Um, we kind of know this already from the context, but it's explicit in verse 5. This is what God the Lord says, the creator of the heavens. Isn't that lovely? You have, you have God, the creator, the eternal God, the powerful God, the only God. But he's also the Lord, Yahweh, Jehovah, the covenant God, the personal God. He's, he's eternal. I am who I am. I will be who I will be. But he's the God who came down and listened to his people's cry and through Moses brought them out of slavery, out of misery in the land of Egypt. But he's more than that. He is a God who alone is to be worshipped. Look on to verse 8. I am the Lord, that is my name. I will not yield my glory to another or my praise to idols. He's not just one alongside others. He is one uh, who, is, who stands out because he alone is the creator. He alone is the eternal God. He alone is the ruler. 
And uh, today, as in Isaiah's day, there were many competing gods wanting to say, oh, follow me, live for me, worship me. But he is the only God and we should worship only him. He will not share his glory. He will not stand alongside someone else to be worshipped. And also, and so important and comforting for us, he is a God who is sovereign. Look at verse 9. The former things have taken place, new things I declare. And is he a God who just watches and sees and, and, and like a commentator today? No. Before they spring into being, I announce them to you. So we've seen something of the servant's character, his mission and of his God. And now we come to the all important question, in a sense, in this. Um, to which we think we know the answer, and of course, in a way we do, but let's just unpack this for a little, because there's great uh, lessons in this for us. Um, who is the servant of the Lord? What's his identity? And you might think, oh, well, it's, it's obvious, and thank God that he has given us some understanding of this. But just let me remind you of um, that Ethiopian who was travelling uh, in, the, in the chariot, uh, returning home from Jerusalem, and Philip uh, goes up to him and he's reading one of the servant songs in Isaiah 53 and um, led like a lamb to the slaughter. He's reading, we're told, and he and he comes to this and he says to Philip, he said, tell me, of whom is the prophet speaking? Is, is he speaking about himself or someone else? Now, he was a, a, a convert to Judaism. We know from Jesus' conversations with the Jews, many of them couldn't, they couldn't make head or tail of the Old Testament passages that spoke, for example, of the Messiah suffering. It made no sense to them. And, and why would the Messiah be a servant? Surely he should be a king. Surely he's going to rescue us. He's going to be high and mighty. Everybody's going to bow down to him. Well, one day, Jesus says yes. But he's come to be handed over to suffer and to die. So let's not be too hasty in condemning others who don't understand. Let's remember there, but for the grace of God, go I. So who is the servant of God? And I, I want to answer this in three stages, if I may, because I think these are, these are important in understanding the depth of what God is saying to us here. And the first answer is this, that Israel was to be the servant of God. In fact, it's explicit with there's so many references, but let me just mention uh, two or three to you if, you if you want to be convinced of this. If you look back a chapter into um, Isaiah chapter 41 and just read verse 8. God is speaking to whom? But you, Israel, my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, you descendants of Abraham, my friend, I took you from the ends of the earth. He's speaking to the nation. The nation was the servant of God. Collectively, the descendants of Abraham were to be God's servants. And if you'd read on in chapter 42, you may have done this at other time, you come to verse 18 and it says, uh, hear you deaf, look you blind and see, who is blind but my servant? And deaf like the messenger I send. Who is blind like the one in his covenant with me, blind like the servant of the Lord? You think, hold on a minute, what's happening here? We've just had a righteous, gentle, spirit-filled servant. Now we've got a blind and deaf one. Because sadly, the, the people of Israel were chosen by God, weren't they? They were set apart. They were given a land. They were to be witnesses. They were to be a light to the nations. People were to look at them. To some degree, that happened. You think of the, 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 the Queen of Sheba who came, amazed at Solomon's wisdom and his wealth, and the people who brought tribute. Uh, but everything so easily, so quickly, went badly wrong. And so we find that, that though Israel is described as the servant of God, Israel is also, in the end, a failure. And the people of Israel are unable to be the witness and the light that God intended them to be. And so we find through the Old Testament, uh, gradually, little by little, I suppose, uh, um, another figure emerges uh, who the Jews began to understand would be the Messiah, the anointed one, the chosen one of God. And he would be the one who would deliver them from the oppression of their enemies. And again, it is a stage, as it were, that the nation seldom acknowledged that they had failed. But they did begin to see that God maybe would do something better than simply send yet another of the judges or another king or another leader, another prophet. 
And so they had this picture of the Messiah, but they were puzzled by that too, weren't they? When they came to chapter 53 particularly that we've already referred to, they couldn't understand how uh, this figure who's described as oppressed and afflicted, led like a lamb to the slaughter, like a sheep before its shearers is silent, did not open his mouth. How could this be? The Messiah, the victorious king, who was going to usher in a new kingdom and in Jesus' day was going to deliver them from the oppression of the Romans. How could this be the Messiah? And so we come, if you like, to the third stage. First of all, the nation should have been the servant. Then uh, uh, a figure, a puzzling figure perhaps, emerges throughout the Old Testament and the, and the prophets. Uh, but we don't know who it's going to be. How can somebody be both uh, a, a victorious king and also a suffering servant. But we soon find out. I want just to take you into the New Testament now for our remaining time and just think particularly of uh, how Matthew introduces Jesus in his gospel. And I, I guess uh, the more you read in the New Testament, um, the more you realise that you need to read more in the Old Testament, don't you? Um, Matthew is remarkable in his gospel. He he begins, as you know, with um, uh, the the account of uh, Jesus' genealogy uh, with Abraham and all through. And we begin to understand that the Old Testament is incredibly important in understanding who Jesus is. So let me just take you um, for a few more minutes now as we look at this to um, the beginning of Jesus' ministry to Matthew chapter 3. And let me read from verse 16. This is the the baptism of Jesus but just listen to the language as we read it's very familiar but listen to it nevertheless as soon as Jesus was baptized he went up out of the water at that moment heaven was opened and he saw the spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him and a voice from heaven said this is my son whom I love with him I am well pleased now, just in your mind, at least, maybe in your Bibles, keep your finger in that and just look back to Isaiah 42. Here is my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him. That's Isaiah 42. Matthew 3, verse uh, 16. He saw the spirit of God descending like a dove. And a voice from heaven said, this is my son whom I love. With him, I am well pleased. Isn't it lovely? That um, unbeknown to us, this strange event of the baptism of Jesus uh, with John, John the Baptist himself, not really understanding. Why do you come to me? He says, he says you should be baptizing me. And Jesus says, no, you don't understand. I've come to fulfill all righteousness and come to represent the people of God, those who should have been God's servant but have failed. I am the true servant of the Lord. I am his chosen one in whom he delights. But Jesus doesn't need to say all that himself. The voice from heaven says it for him. This is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. And in fact, Matthew is explicit later on. Uh, that's Matthew 3 verse 17. Let me just take you to Matthew 12. And uh, the NIV um, tells us what this is about in its heading. Matthew 12 verse 15, headed God's chosen servant. Um, let me read from verse 15. Uh, Matthew 12, 15. Aware of this, Jesus withdrew from that place. A large crowd followed him and he healed all who were ill. He warned them not to tell others about him. This was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah. Here is my servant whom I've chosen, the one I love in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him, and so on. And he's quoting Isaiah 42 and verses 1 to 4. In other words, Matthew knows that Jesus is the Messiah. He is the servant. He is the one who was spoken of in Isaiah 42. And he explicitly identifies that with him. And clearly, it, it, there's so much there that we could unpack about the ministry of Jesus. Much of it was just in embryo, as it were. Uh, he didn't heal everybody. Um, those whom he healed would have 
maybe got ill again, they would, they would die. He didn't change everything, but he demonstrated that he had the power. He had the power of the creator to calm the storm. He had the power of the creator to heal diseases. He had the power of the Holy Son of God to, uh, to, uh, to cast out demons. He was, and he is, the servant of the Lord, the Son, the Messiah. And so really what I'm saying to you today is that the passage that we've looked at in Isaiah 42 gives us tremendous encouragement to understand more of the depth of the character and the being of Jesus. I've already said, haven't I, he was gentle. And Matthew has that. Here it is. I've got this page open. I've just looked at Matthew 12. So I've got Matthew 11 in front of me. What does Jesus say? Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Why? How? Because I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. The bruised reed he will not break, and the smoking wick he will not snuff out. Jesus is like that. He knows suffering, he knows pain, and he doesn't inflict it on us. He brings comfort. And he knows our sin, and he bore our sin in his body on the tree as he died there on the cross. And he knows the awfulness of God's judgment as it fell upon him as he suffered there. And on the cross, as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. That is the gospel message, that Jesus is the servant of God. He is the chosen one. And although we sometimes rightly speak about ourselves as servants, we're only servants because he was the servant. He has trod that road before us. He knows what it's like. And we don't need to prove ourselves to God. We don't need to say, I'll serve you well and then maybe you'll be pleased with me. Remember when the Israelites came out of Egypt and were given the, the law, the Ten Commandments, God said, I have brought you up out of the land of Egypt. Now live this way. They weren't obeying the law in order to earn his favour. That would have been impossible. It still is today. But Jesus has come and he has fulfilled everything that God requires as his perfect servant. And now we serve, as it were, following in his footsteps and Jesus too brings us that release we could look at Luke chapter 4 where he quotes from Isaiah 61 uh, and he says today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing uh, let me just end if I may with this with this practical application we we rightly fix our eyes on Jesus that's our calling as Christians to follow in his footsteps we do that because he has achieved salvation for us there was no other good enough to pay the price of sin. He only could unlock the gate of heaven and let us in. He has paid for my sin. I trust in him. But I don't just stand, as it were, gazing at him and doing nothing. I, I, I fix my eyes on him as I walk, as I travel, as I follow. And I'm treading a difficult path. Difficult for you, difficult for me. Difficult in different ways. And I do it as a witness to the Lord Jesus. And this Isaiah 42 passage helps me to understand something of his character. So I want, with the Spirit's help, who has been given to me with his Spirit, I want to be righteous and faithful and just in what I do. I want to be holy. I want to be godly. But to be godly is to be compassionate and kind and gentle and humble. It's to make sure that when we see people who are struggling, we don't snuff them out. Oh, um, you could do better than that. Or we've had that problem before. We've sorted that. No, like Jesus, we were to listen and to understand and to bring not only the love of Jesus, but where we have opportunity by God's grace to bring the message of the cross and the message of the forgiveness of sin and the hope of eternal life to those who will hear. So in these difficult times, we need more than ever to see the character and the mission and the heart of the servant of the Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this portrait of Jesus in Isaiah. And we pray that as we have seen that, that you would uh, help us in our minds, certainly, but also in our hearts to love him more because he has first loved us. And, and please, by your spirit, help us to become more like Jesus so that as we speak to people, as we care for them in their need, as we care for one another, that we might see more of his light and his life in us and through us, we pray that others would come to love him and to trust him. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.